If you're a penetration tester today, mark my words, mark my words, you need to start learning how to hack APIs because that is what's coming if it's not already here. One of the things is my, I like starting my conferences out with a, a great quote from Anonymous. And that's, if I were to advise a rogue nation state on how to take down the United States, I would tell them to start with the APIs first. And that's because cyberspace is the ultimate equalizer. And I, one individual, one little old girl in Las Vegas, can take down an entire country simply because I know how to hack APIs. And that entire country is being powered by APIs from industrial control systems all the way to the cars that are driving around on the road. <laughs>
and then hacked healthcare APIs and accessed millions of patient records because of improperly secured and unhardened AP fire APIs. So um, yeah, we're kind of it's, I'm kind of all over the place. Like I said to you earlier before the show started, you know, I'm I'm trying to cram as many lifetimes into my one lifetime as I can because tomorrow's not promised to any of us. That's exactly right. I mean, you, so you you wrote this. But you're also writing a book on API hacking, is that right? Yeah. So I'm. I'm so we. The, my first book was published with Wiley. Yeah. Uh, and then I saw. <laughs> this is gonna sound awful, but I saw how much money they were taking from the book sales. Yep. So I was like, you know, why don't I? So I went to my wife Mel, and I was like, why don't we just start our own publishing company? And then publish all of our books under Night Publishing, where we now also have a publishing company. And my new book on hacking APIs will actually be published under our new production company, Night Publishing. When, so, and when, when um, will that be out? Sorry. This year. This year. Right. So, uh, you know, we're, we're, my plan is to try and get it done and out um, before, I'd, I'd like to do it before that Black Hat DEF CON. Uh, so I can, because I'm going, obviously going to those conferences and I plan to do book signings at Black Hat and DEF CON. So if any of you are are coming to Hacker Summer Camp this year in person, yes, we're back to in person, then I will be glad to do a book signing with you. I mean, that's brilliant. I mean, there's a lot to talk about. So I, I heard you, you you had an interview with uh, Nahomsek and I'll link yeah, that below. Ben. Great, great, yeah. great, great interview with Ben. And you. you mentioned something which I really like. Can you define hacking? Because you, you kind of used this term that I really liked. So yeah. what would you define so, as hacking? So that's a great question, David. And uh, I, I mean, I've seen so many definitions of hacking. Yep. And my definition for those, of, oh, I think there's some people that will disagree and want to key my car over this. But, you know, to me, hacking is nothing more than just sending stimulus to an, app, an, an application that the developer didn't anticipate. And then, you know, sending a response to that stimulus. So, you know, it's 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 trying to take things apart and figure out how something works and then sending a stimulus that the developer didn't expect. You know, that's to me what hacking is. It's it's just trying to figure out how something works. I, I start on a new vulnerability research project, like, for example, the hacking 55 banks and cryptocurrency exchanges through their APIs. I didn't know even how to spell API. I, you know, a lot of people think that hackers come out of the womb knowing this stuff, but we really don't. We do research and learn just like you do. I, I had to go out there and research the history of APIs. Um, why do hackers freak out when they see JSON, you know, yeah. responses and move on to the next target? Um, you know, what is JSON? And so I, you know, there was a lot of learning in that experience. Uh, where you're just kind of tinkering. And one of the things that, you know, I would urge all of you to do for those of you who are red teamers in the audience and, and ethical hackers is, you know, don't be so rigid and static about your hacking and your tactics and techniques when you act like, I need to follow the penetration testing execution standard and start out with intelligence collection and move on to reconnaissance. It's not that rigid. Like, yeah. be more creative and... First and foremost, figure out how it works, right? So you showed me, you, you showed the my my first book, I'm Hacking Connected Cars. And I actually wrote a majority of that in Germany when I was living there, working for some of the largest car makers and uh, tier one OEMs and hacking their fleets of commercial vehicles. And I'm sorry, their fleets of connected vehicles. And one of the things that I learned in that process was I have no idea what an electronic control unit is. I have no idea what a telematics control unit is, I, but I'm going to learn. Yeah. And so I, I, I was fortunate enough to have a client that literally, and he's my friend to this day, sat, just locked me in a room and whiteboarded with me and taught me vehicular mechatronics and, you know, all of these other different concepts of in vehicle networking and v2v and and just taught me how it works you can't hack something when you don't know how it's supposed to work under normal operation all hacking is is just trying to figure out what the developer didn't expect to receive that's all hacking is and so yeah so that's my definition of hacking that was long-winded but that's no, I love it. I love it because I mean, it was. I, I love this that you're sending stimulus. It's something that the developer didn't think about or didn't expect, and then yeah, you get, stimulus and response. It's like you know, if I've got this this API, right? And let's say it's a public public and documented API. It's got a, you know, open API specification swagger, and and I want people to write for it. 
But that Swagger file or that open API file says you can only send this API request and this API request, right? So it's documented when you're writing a mobile app or something for my API, that's all you can send. But uh, in the back end, the API actually supports a hundred different request types and the documentation the Swagger file only says it only supports two. Hacking is sending the other 98 API attempts and requests to see if it's it's supported. You know, that's really to me all hacking is, is it's it's yeah, it's this is the documented functionality of this. This is the way it's supposed to work. But let's see if it supports things that aren't documented. Let's see if it supports things that you're not telling me it doesn't support. Trust and verify. Right. Yeah. So I mean, I, I, I want to get to the the car hacking and the API hacking, but let's let's get sort of your experience and your brain to help everyone. How do you approach? Like you said, like you were going to hack cars and you had someone help you, but how did you, like with the APIs? How did you approach that? Did you just read up on use Google? How did you how do you learn this knowledge? Because you you cover so many things. I mean, in your journey, you've done so many things. How do you suddenly like become an expert at hacking cars and then an expert at hacking APIs? Yeah. So. I, you know, I, I am so glad that you asked this question. I, I, I want to talk about this because yeah. oh, there, this uh, the, a very systemic concern I think within cybersecurity is that being a jack of all trades and master of none is a bad thing. That you should niche yourself and become a master. Okay, but here's the thing, David. Over time, that quote has been butchered. And that's actually not the full quote. And it's actually a jack of all trades is a master of none, but oftentimes better than a master of one. That's and so yeah. over time, a lot of people don't know this. Jack of all trades is master of none is only the first half of that quote. And so over time, we just kept repeating it, repeating it and rinsing and reusing it and plagiarizing it. Yeah. And everyone kept plagiarizing it from the previous person. And it's somewhere along the way, the last half of that quote got cut out. And so for me, you know, I've always lived my life that I want to learn as much as I can about everything. So if I'm, you know, in a situation where I don't know how to do something, I don't want to have to have the, the fate of my project or the or my fate in general just predicated on this person like dependent on this person doing this for me i want to know so i don't have to put all of my eggs in their basket right i don't i i, I always want to be there being able to say it's the same thing with filmmaking right david so you know as a director i want to know exactly what my cinematographer director of photography knows how to do with the red cameras i want to know you know, what my audio, my production sound mixer, I want to know how that equipment works and how to do that. And my my gaffer and my lighting person, I want to know how to do all that. So just in case I need to step up and do something, I know how to do it. And so I, I sort of, I guess, applied that same mentality to cybersecurity where if I run into an API, I want to know how to hack that API. If I run into a VPN, I want to know how to circumvent that. A lot of people don't know this, David. I actually published the first vulnerability on hacking VPNs in 2000. And then in 2001, wow. I spoke about it at Black Hat briefings at Caesars Palace. And um, it was the first vulnerability on bug track. And what had happened was the VPN company had hard-coded the root password into the SSH binary oh, wow. or the appliance. But they haven't and, learned because aren't they doing the same with APIs now? Yeah, Sorry, go on, like, I interrupt they're, they're, you. They're, yeah, come, yeah, developers are hard-coding passwords into mobile apps, you know, so and API keys and tokens. But I, it's so please, uh, if your audience, if you take one thing away from this, take this away. Like, just remember, there's another half to that quote of it being better than a master of one. You know, so learn as much as you can uh, in this lifetime. In other words, mm -hmm. you've got this, like, I would say insatiable, like, uh, learning thing where you want to learn more as much as you can about any topic that you're interested in. So like you wanted to do filmmaking. So you try and learn everything uh, or as much right. as you can get an understanding of everything. So Cor yeah, correct. Yeah, exactly. Sorry. Yeah, so exactly. And, and that's the thing is you have to have that grit. You have to have yeah. that, that just passion in that, that in Spanish fuego, you know, that fire, to want to get up and learn something new every single day. And so in order to accomplish that, I have this daily task sheet. I just published it on LinkedIn. 
Um, you like oh, this book? Yeah, Hyper Focus from Chris Bailey. Great book. Um, so, you know, and, and I took the the concepts from that book and and self journal and you know the best self from best self co and all these things and created a spreadsheet where I basically block out 30 minute blocks in my day and I make sure that the first thing that I budget my time for today and every day is taking 30 minutes of training, learning something new, taking 30 minutes out to read. Because I I really hate it when I hear someone say, I don't have time to read. Yeah. I don't have time to do this. I don't have time to do that. You have to make the time. And if that means getting up earlier or sleeping faster, <laughs> then do that. As Arnold Schwarzenegger says, then learn to sleep faster. It's so important that that capacity building is so important because you can't stay still. In in, in the military, there's this, this quote that if, if you stay still, you're dead. Right. Yep. You got to keep moving. And I, I really believe it's the same thing in life. And one thing that all of you need to remember is our brains are muscles, too. And you and just like you work out your muscles, you need to work out your brain. And that means reading and doing capacity building to learn and continuing to learn. It's, it's so important. I, I, I want to get back to you, like your time management, because when I when I saw what you do and that like spreadsheet that you, you have, it's um, and I'll link that below. It, it's an amazing it's amazing how much you can do in a day. And I mean, the fact that you run all these companies and do all these things is, is like unbelievable, really. You manage to do so, so much. But I want to come back to you to this thing and I want to push you on it. Let's say you, you you're suddenly interested in hacking APIs and this is a new thing. How do you like what's your methodology of way of attacking that from being like, I know nothing about this topic to like, now you're the expert in this topic. And like, you know, you said you didn't know how to hack cars and now you've got a book on hacking cars, which we'll get into the technical details in a moment. But how do you approach that? Do you just like consume knowledge, YouTube videos, you know, what's sort of your game plan? So I look at it as like a blank piece of paper. Um, if if any of you have heard, if, you know, applied the concept of mind mapping, mind mapping in college or remember mind mapping, um, it's it's the idea that you start with a central thought and then you branch out to these other nodes within the mind map. And the first thing I do is I start out with the center topic, like hacking APIs or hacking cars. And then I start mapping out what are the things within that sphere of hacking cars that I need to be aware of. So as a hacker, the first thing you need to be aware of is what are your ingress points? How do you communicate with the car? What does hacking a car mean? What exactly does that mean? Is You're, you're not... You know, I mean, that could mean many things. It could be, it could mean throwing a, a brick through the window and reaching in and unlocking the doors to hacking the car through Bluetooth or wireless. You know, so the first thing I do is I start mapping out what are my communication interfaces for that target. With a car, it's telematics control unit. It's the router or modem for the car. So that's one ingress point, right? So the telematics control unit is the router for the car and it uses GSM to communicate. So I put that on that node, right? I put that on that that little square is GSM TCU. Okay. What what are the other communication interfaces? Bluetooth. Okay. So I put down Bluetooth. Uh, infotainment system. That's kind of like the computer screen or media entertainment system within the car. So that has a USB port, right? Okay. That's yeah. a communication interface, right? I Then I found out, realized that the in-vehicle networking, that everything is connected within the car. So if you've seen that car commercial where the person is, the driver's turning the steering wheel left, you can see in that car, I think it was an Audi, See the car, the headlights were turning left yeah. as the car was taking the turn. That's because the headlights are connected and are communicating with other electronic control units within the car. So if I remove the headlight, doesn't that give me access to the in-vehicle network? Because it's it's connected to the headlights. Yeah. It's not just electricity. Yeah. So, you know, you've, we found that you could hack a car by taking the headlight out and communicate. And, and there's the, the communication port that the... Um, headlights are connected to. So you map out all of the communication interfaces, what is called also um, referred to colloquially as the attack surface, Yeah. right? So that's your attack surface. Then those are the things that I need to study and learn. I need to know what a TCU is. Okay, what are the different TCUs out there? Uh, how does it communicate? Okay, GSM. I need to learn how to hack GSM. Okay, rogue base stations. What's that? How do you build one? Okay, I need to build a rogue base station. Okay, these cars communicate with APIs. That was my most recent research. So, you know, the, the thing is, is that you're, you're figuring out what your attack surface is and what you can actually target with the device you're targeting. Yeah. And then learning more about those things. So with APIs, it's like, okay, let me go research the history of APIs. All right, 
There's different types of APIs. There's RESTful APIs, like REST APIs. Yeah. There's GraphQL. There's these different types of APIs. Okay, how do REST APIs work? Okay, what types of REST APIs do you have? You've got private, you've got public, you've got web APIs, you've got mobile APIs. Okay, mobile apps communicate with APIs. Okay, Android hacking, Android mobile app hacking. I need to research that. iOS hacking, I need to research that. You're kind of building this spider web of yeah. all of these things that you can target that you need to learn how to build or create or, or, or do vulnerability research into. And then that just kind of creates a a step-by-step -step attack map or kill chain for hacking that particular thing. So, so it's, it's, it's a very kind of, I start with the blank page. I, I like to say, uh, and I, I'm gonna plagiarize this from Quentin Tarantino. I believe that God put me on earth to face the blank page. You know, it's just, yep. I, I, and if you think about it, that's really, we're, we're all faced with a blank page, whether it's screenwriting or hacking a car or hacking APIs or hacking a firewall or hacking a VPN. We're all faced with that blank page because we all start out with not knowing anything about it. I, I love that, like, you you've, you got into hacking when you were 13, is that right? I mean, you didn't Correct. follow some kind of course or some kind of curriculum. I you didn't, because if you think about it, David, they, they didn't really exist back yeah. then. When I started in hacking, even if, if you recall in the 90s, there was no master's degree in cybersecurity. There was no, you know, there was no SANS training center there was no, you know, the, at the time, even security focus, for those of you who remember that, there was none of that. And so yeah. it, it really irks me. I have an open door policy, so please don't take this the wrong way. You can reach out to me on social media and say hi and tell me, you know, what the color of the sky is today. I don't care. <laughs> um, but when people reach out to me on social media and say, Alyssa, can you teach me how to hack? How do you do that, David? Like, okay, yep. so I'm gonna spend an hour a day on social media teaching you how to hack. I've been doing this for 22 years. The thing is, is that when I started out, you know, it's great, we have this collaboration, we have securitytube.net, we have, uh, you know, SANS, we have all these places you can go, we've got books. Do you think that there were, you know, Metasploit Unleashed or all these hacking books, <laughs> the, the Hacker's Blueprint? They didn't exist back then. You had to download exploit source code, which is what I did, looked at the source code, modified it, recompiled it, trying to change it or trying to get it to do something else. Uh, I reverse engineered the exploits and, and modified them so I could learn how they work. I ran them and then used TCP dump at the time Ethereal, which is yep. now called Wireshark, to analyze the packets, to look at the packets, and I ended up becoming a packet monkey. And, and really getting into packets and, and trying to learn how things work through packets, which is how I was able to circumvent VPNet appliances and, and subsequently spoke about it at Black Hat briefings on how to circumvent any VPNet appliance was just looking at the packets and seeing what the packets were doing. You can tell so much about the way an application works, about the way an exploit works, the way malware works, the way a black box works by looking at the packets. That's so interesting. To me, yeah, to me, it's a storyteller. So, I mean, so what kind of like skills or attributes would you, you know, say that have helped you the most and what, what should someone try and develop? I mean, curiosity, I suppose. Um, you, you said grit, things like that. Is that right? I think the desire. Yeah. Now, now let me, let me, let me expound on that. I can teach you, David, how to hack a TCU. I can teach you how to use Metasploit. I can yeah. teach you how to hack an API. But I can't teach you the passion yep. or the interest in learning how to do it. Um, there have been a lot of people al along the last 22 years who've come and gone in my life who, like, I want to make six figures. I want to be a junior security analyst making 90000 a year. I want to make 250000 a year being a senior engineer. There's that interest to make the money, but they don't have the interest in what it takes to learn. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know, we can go down this whole religious debate about being generational Gen Z and millennials versus Gen <laughs> X, you know, whatever. But, you know, a lot of people want to skip directly, you know, they want to skip in line and cut directly to the $250,000 a year salary. You, you got to work your way up. You got to start looking at packets. You got to start system administration. The best security engineers I ever met started out as network admins or sysadmins because they understand the layer three, layer two, layer one. They understand operating systems. 
uh, there was this one time in, in where I was sitting in IRC. For those of you who remember IRC. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Um, I'm old enough, but not everyone watching is perhaps old enough. You probably <laughs> even remember Prodigy, David. Like, yes. Do you remember Prodigy? I'm, I'm old. That I'm an old. like our internet was Prodigy. I, I'm an old um, man. Yeah, it's yeah, like Discord it for everyone email. else. Yep. Oh, yeah, sorry, go on. before email. Um, but, you know, the, at the time, you know, you just, you didn't have the resources that you have today. Yeah. And you just you have you have to have that interest. And I was sitting on IRC and this this, you know, I and I hate this term. I'll I'll use it only once. It's called the you know, script kitty. Yeah. The script kitty came online. It was just basic and basically script kitty is someone who just period dot slashes and runs an exploit, doesn't know what it does and doesn't know what to do after that. You know, dot C ran this this uh dot slash ran this this exploit, got a shell on an Apache server and didn't know how to restart Apache. Oh, wow. And it was like, you know this individual came on IRC asking how to restart Apache. How can you be hacking networks? How can you be hacking systems without knowing how to restart Apache? My advice, understand the OS, understand packets, understand what a TCP three-way handshake is. You need to go through all of that before you get to the fun stuff of exploits and buffer overflows. So would you would you recommend any kind of certs or any kind of path or books? What, what's your yeah, recommendation? You know, I, I hate to start the narrative from certifications. I like to start the narratives from the learning path to get that yeah, certification. That's great. Yeah, the certification is great if you can if you if you can get it and you can l memorize what's needed to memorize to go get your CISSP. But reading the CBK, the Common Body of Knowledge, understanding that mile wide and inch thick book on every topic regarding cybersecurity networking and systems is so important. If you can then go and take the exam and get the cert, great, awesome, do it. But don't make that the reason that you go and do this. Learn, do it for the learning. Um, OSCP, same thing. Do it for the practicals, do it for the learning. CISSP, do it for the learning. SANS certifications, if you can afford them, it's ridiculously it expensive. Is. Sorry, yep. sorry if SANS is a sponsor of yours. No, 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 um, there's, but, there's, there's, but, <laughs> I'll say this, there's no sponsors on this video for, okay, cool. for that, okay, so you can cool. say what you want. Okay, good. Um, look, SANS courses are great, but there's no reason to be charging the same amount of money for a virtual online course that you charge for someone to fly out and be there in person. That's how was how were how was that ever okay to do? Um, but you know what? I get it. You're a business, and and you need to make your money. But SANS, for example, if you can afford that, just don't do it for the certification. Do it for the learning path. Yeah, I love that. I mean, it's like desire, passion. I see this in so many spheres of life. Some people like might be handicapped by money, but because they've got the desire, the passion, they they break through and make a success. Yeah, they overcome those those challenges. Yeah, anyone can throw money all day long. That's got the money to sign up for this, 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 and this. Yeah. But a lot of the people that I know that do that, David, don't take the time to take the class or exactly. forget that they they paid for the class and never took it. And then there's the people who don't have the money and they're doing everything they can to afford it, and then. Obviously, they worked so hard for that money to buy that class that they made sure to show up and they made sure to do the homework and they made sure to learn what it and got every ounce of education from that curriculum they could because they worked so hard to get it. You know, yeah, I think I think that's the most important thing is is what can you take from it in, in going through it versus that piece of paper at the end of the day, because you still got to pass the interview. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that's a whole different discussion, isn't it? Because the yeah. I, I think anyone who's been in, in this game for any length of time knows someone or has heard of someone who had the cert but didn't know the answers in the interview. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've interviewed people that had every Cisco certification under the sun, but as yep. soon as I asked them, tell me the header of a packet, you know, tell me all the headers from the Ethernet header down to the payload, they couldn't do it. I'm like, dude, you got a CCNA? You're, you know, you're, you're, you've got all of these certifications from Cisco, and you don't know what the headers of a packet are. I don't think, I don't think many people would know it off by heart, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, I'm, it's, I'm one of those weirdos that I guess did. But. No, 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 no. It's, it's interesting. I mean, it's, um, I think the difference is, and I, I think this is the big difference. If you're using Scapy or something to create, uh, like, fake traffic into a network, I saw you yeah. using Scapy in this, this car yeah. hacking book. Yeah. Um, you're very quickly going to learn those headers. Or if you're going through Wireshark and you actually yeah. looking at that, because it's practical and it's real, you learn a lot. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. And so I think just by virtue of doing it and loading it, like a lot of people think, oh, you know, I need to 
build this amazing virtual machine lab, throw out some, rock out some Docker containers and some, you know, vulnerable <laughs> hosts, and then get some exploits, get my hands on exploit DB exploits, and 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 then record the packets. Dude, you can turn on Wireshark right now yep. and start sniffing your traffic and look at those packets. You don't have to like, I need to go get this zero day exploit and, I need to, and then run it and then capture it. Just turn on Wireshark, it, learn, look at what, what's coming in and out of your computer. Understand that you're only gonna see broadcasts when a machine is communicating to a local machine on network and you're only gonna see, you know, they're only gonna be communicating with the MAC address when it's communicating on the local LAN. You know, all these yeah. things about n basic networking fundamentals but they want to jump all the way up to zero day exploits, but they don't know what a packet is. Come on. What you, I, I heard you, I wouldn't say it's controversial, but I'd say you've got it. You've got, what's your take on, um, do you have to <laughs> Dude, learn? My middle name is controversy. <laughs> so you I can love it. use the C word. It's okay. I'm okay with that. No, I love it because it's, you, you know, the thing is, there's an, I love it when they're different views. And I mean, you've, You've been doing this for twenty odd years. You, you've proven. You don't. I mean, you have nothing to prove. You've done this. You've you've done crazy things, for lack of a better word. Um, and it's great to get your opinion on these things. So my question was: Do you have to learn to become a programmer, or do you have to learn programming to hack? Oh my God! I'm so <laughs> glad that you brought this up. Um, yeah, I'm really glad that you brought that up. And it, it is. It's such a polarized debate. And I've had. I try not to get into, you know, just mudslinging contests on social media and, and, and actually engaging with trolls, you know, um, because you could just spend all day doing that and let that affect you. But there were there were some folks who approached me on Twitter and LinkedIn and talked about the fact that you can't be this elite hacker unless you knew how to program. And I've run into it in my career as well, obviously. And of course, those people were programmers. But no, the long story short, I do not believe you need to be a programmer in order to be a hacker. Here's why. Because hacking is so many other things than just writing exploits. Yep. You know, what about the amazing social engineers out there when you're targeting a network and there is no vulnerable service for you to go after and you have to spearfish someone? That's an art form, David. Like, yep. I know some social engineers that can get me. And I've been doing this for, for a long time. No, I don't think you need to, to code. So for those of you who hate programming like me, for those of you who hate scripting like me, you do not need to be this you know amazing developer in order to be a hacker. If you're interested in programming and you want to learn how to program, then more power to you. I had absolutely no interest in staring at lines of code all day. I'm an artist. I'm a visual person. Uh, you know, I'm rocking out Photoshop and Adobe After Effects and you know Cinema 4D. I don't want to stare at lines of text all day. But I have an I have an immense amount, a profound amount of respect for programmers who are like, I want to write a program that does this and be able to just bust out the code and write that program. But you don't need to know how to program to be a hacker. Uh, you know, there's some amazing hackers out there where a lot of the times, if you think about it, David, most of the successful penetration tests throughout history have never needed to be conducted or executed with a zero day exploit. You know, there's networks out there that are still vulnerable to eternal blue. There, it's You don't need to be able to write a zero day exploit or write a buffer overflow in order to get a foothold or beachhead on a network. So many organizations struggle to keep up with patch and vulnerability management that there's no sense in saying that you have to be a programmer in order to be a hacker. It's just not necessary. But you do need to understand, like, let's, I was going to talk about cars, but let's talk about APIs because we're talking about programming. You do have an understanding of APIs and like REST and, you know, post and put and yeah, all this stuff. You, yeah, yeah. There, I mean, there is obviously something beyond dot slashing and, you know, with, with things like APIs. I mean, I had to learn Postman. I had to understand that you need a dedicated API client in order to be able to do the things you want to do with an API. And I, I stumbled on Postman. You know, there there are tools you need. There's an understanding of those tools. You know, just because you can go out to Home Depot to buy a drill or a miter saw doesn't mean that you know how to use it, the, you know, effectively like, you know, a general contractor can. Just because you can go out there and purchase a copy of Burp Suite instead of using the Community Edition doesn't mean you automatically are a hacker and know how to use it. You have to learn the math. You have to master the tools of your trade. 
a tool is only as good as the person using it, right? You know, I'm I'm a strong believer in that. Yeah. So yes, you, I did have to. Yeah, you know, I have to understand API requests. You have to understand JSON. You have to look at JSON, understand what it's doing. You have to understand what you're looking at that the tool, the the empirical data is is being provided. You need to understand it. You need to be able to demystify what's happening right now when you're sending that API request. What's the difference between a put and a delete? You know, what are HTTP verbs and what is their consequence on this API request? So tell me, with the APIs, you 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 hacked a bunch of banks. You 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 hacked medical <laughs> records. And I, 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 I think you said it in the introduction, but just remind me, it was what, like you were doing like eight minutes an app or something crazy. You were hacking these banking apps. Is that right? Yeah. So it originally started with um, a set of fintech and financial services apps. That was my yeah. first foray into vulnerability research where I downloaded, it was, I think it was 20 financial services and fintech mobile apps. The research was sponsored um, and I, I ended up, um, reverse engineering those and learning what what does that mean to reverse engineer an Android APK file and yeah. what are the tools that you need to do it and then being able to comb that source code for hard coded API keys and tokens and then taking that further and realizing why what's this whole world of APIs what are these keys and tokens doing and and so researching that and then I I my next vulnerability research was downloading and and then hacking and going after the API endpoints that these app, apps were communicating with. And of course, this was um, in collaboration with the banks. Um, there was no illegal stuff happening here. <laughs> so a very large bank came along and several several financial services companies came along and said, Alyssa, you understand APIs. Uh, we want you to come in and hack these and tell us how, how vulnerable they're. See, here's the thing, David. You can't just throw a rock and hit a penetration tester that knows how to hack APIs. I know the most senior penetration testers in the world been doing it for 20 plus years and they stay away from APIs. They run screaming when they see JSON. Just because you're a senior penetration tester doesn't mean that you know how to hack APIs. But I think that's changing and I and hashtag more please. I want to see more of that, which is why Mel and I created the API Secure Conference. Here's the thing. When I think of an API hacker, there's only a few names that come to your mind, right, David? There's Dr. Katie Paxton Fear, She's a huge influencer uh, in the API hacking space. Shine my own spotlight, me, right? So there's me, there's Dr. Katie Paxton Fear, there's David Sopas, who created that huge mind map of um, all the different tools used in API hacking. He's he's going to actually be uh, speaking at our conference. But So there's only a few names. I can count them only on one hand. We need to change that. Right, I'm sure there's other API hackers out there that I've missed, but the ones that are out there in front of the camera, sharing knowledge, um, you know, trying to create more YouTube videos around this to teach it, um, really, you know, are myself, Dr. Katie Paxton Fear, and and we need to change that. And that was the impetus behind us creating this conference uh, was to be able to train future women, non-binary. You know, disenfranchised, just and and men, and also you know, male allies, and and just everyone who identifies, no matter what your gender is, you know, just trying to train future hackers and of APIs and defenders, because this is where the data is, David. And there's a reason that Gartner said that APIs are going to be the number one point of entry for breaches in 2022, because that's where the data is. If you want oil, what do you do, David? You go to where the oil wells are, exactly. right? You go. Yeah. That's where you go. You go to the oil fields and you drill where the oil is. If you're hacking today, it's for profiting off of the data. You know, you and I talked about what it was like 20 years ago. It was about defacing websites and World of Hell and Rafa was here and getting on that all does defacement mirror. Now today, it's about stealing data. It's ransomware. It's profiting twice off of that data with lock and leak, you know, ransoming the company that you've stolen the data from and still leaking it and then selling it on the dark web. And where is that data these days now? They're not sitting on file servers. They're sitting in APIs. There's the, So you need to learn how to hack APIs if you're going to go after the data. So I, th I believe that that's the future battlefront is APIs, if not today. I'm glad you said that because it's like for people who are up and coming in the industry, you don't necessarily want to go after what everyone else is 
you know, ready a master at. You want to try and get into something new. You mentioned you mentioned like uh, cryptocurrencies and stuff like that. I mean, it looks like APIs, from what I've seen you say in the past, is one of those things that's often an afterthought. Like I think you mentioned that some of the apps were created by the marketing departments, not by technical yeah. people. And you, so let, let let's talk about that. And then also like your you have you you had you mentioned this thing about like developers versus security. And I, I, I can't say it as well as you, you you said. So can you explain that as well? Where you said like there should be a security group looking at the APIs. Yeah. So I'm a big believer, David, in shift left security shield right. So shift left security is the idea that you're weaving cybersecurity into the software development lifecycle while the code is being written or while the product is being manufactured, all the way up to shielding, right? Once it's deployed in production, you're protecting it against future vulnerabilities and other flaws that you may miss. Because until computers can write their own code, it's going to be vulnerable. Humans are, you know, we're fallible. We're, we make mistakes. We, we will write insecure code. So we need to protect it in production once it's there for the things that we missed or that our tools missed. You know, so yeah, I mean, there, there's definitely that shield, you know, that that shift left and shield right mentality. And then there was the first part of your question. Can you, can you repeat that one? Yeah, sorry. What I was saying is um, it looks like a lot of APIs haven't been developed properly, if you, if for lack of a better word. Like I think you mentioned that some of the banking apps were developed by marketing departments. Yeah. It was like an yeah. afterthought. Yeah, sorry, go on. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. And and then, you know, with, with the research, I think this was the most startling thing for me that I wasn't prepared for. So one of the banks, extremely large bank, I mean, for those of you who think, oh, well, let's say you just targeted small community banks that don't have a budget and don't have people that know what they're doing. These are, these are financial services and fintech companies that have billions of dollars of assets under management in some cases, trillions of dollars. Wow. One of the most startling things for me from this research was that a lot of the banks, as a matter of fact, about 300 of them had actually outsourced the development of their APIs and their apps to a single company. Wow. And that single company was developing these APIs and apps. So the vulnerabilities that I found in one bank had been actually <laughs> copied and pasted and reused into oh, 300 wow. other banks. It was, I would say, probably the biggest finding of my, my two-decade career. The other thing is, you know, like you said, in organizations where the marketing department was involved in developing the app and not necessarily the cybersecurity team. In one instance, the bank, the cybersecurity team for the bank didn't even know that the development was going on, that didn't know that, you know, the CTO and the chief product officer and the people that were responsible for building the app had even started a project to do it. And it's that whole working in a vacuum. This is, and I don't think it's intentional. I'm, I'm not a pessimist. I like to look at, I like to see the good in people versus immediately saying, well, they did this intentionally to hide it. I feel like people are just so laser focused these days when they are, um, that they don't think about involving the CISO or the security team. It's, and it's not intentional. It's not to be malicious. I think they're just focused on a deadline and getting there and then forgetting, oh my God, the security team doesn't know about this. Oh my God, they haven't tested it. Um, so I think, you know, conferences, shows like yours, I think all of these things are helping to change that narrative and are bringing us into a more secure future. But I think it's we we need we can only change it with education, and and I feel like we'll 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 start to move away from organizations that it's just the marketing department. I mean, it's quite shocking because in the UK, and I'm pretty sure it must be the same in like the US, the the big banks or the financial firms are pushing people to use their phones more and more and more, like use yeah. the use the app on your phone. Don't use the internet, you know, like a browser on your computer. Use the app on the phone. And you you like think it's going to be secure. But like what you're telling us is it's not. Well, here's the thing, David. So yeah, I, a lot of people don't know this about me, but I have a 17-year-old son. He's actually yeah. turning 18 in April. And um, so he grew up in a very different time than yeah. you and I did, right? Yeah. Like we we grew up on a mouse. This generation has never used a mouse. They, they know what mice are, but they've never really used one. They're the iPad generation. And they're the touchscreen generation. You know, my niece walked up to our TV because the Apple TV was on the screen and she walked up and she started trying to push on the screen of our TV <laughs> yep. because she thought it was touchscreen. But that's what we're dealing with. 
the number of laptop sales are going down while the number of, of cellular phone serve, uh, sales are going up, right? So I feel like it's going to get to a point where we just try and do everything on our phone. We're, we're conditioning yep. ourselves, even you and me, we're conditioning yep. ourselves to like not want to run to our, our laptop to type up that email. It's like, it's quicker just to quickly go on and type up that email on our phones. I feel like that's the what, what we're moving to. And so, yep. yes, you're right. It isn't secure. A lot of these mobile apps and a lot of the developers I'll talk to. So one of the financial services companies, I found a director full of unprotected private keys in there. And like, you know, pre-computed, no password. I, I, I'm i like, what, what are you doing? And this developer's no. response was, how did you even know that directory was there? How did you get to those keys? It's on your phone. I was like, are you kidding me? Wow. You didn't know that you can extract an APK file off of an Android device and upload it to Google Drive and then download it to my workstation and then browse the directory structure and look at the source code on my computer. There's an app for that. You know, it's in Google Play Store. You, it's uh, coincidentally enough, ironically enough, it's there's a tool in the Google Play Store for extracting APKs off of an Android device. And this is a developer. And it's like, how did you how did you reverse that back to the source code when it's on your Android device? I think it's like any new thing, isn't it? It's it's like the flavor the of the shiny day. Shiny new toy. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You that and then you know the security is often forgotten because they want to rush this out and it's like look at our new cool app. It sounds like there's a lot of opportunities, but the big question is always how do I learn this stuff? We, where's your book? You know, we we need your book. Um, Give me the shortcut. <laughs> Give me the book. Give me the trip class. Give me, you know, it's God. I, you know, I, I hate to sound like a broken record, but look, it's the answer is everywhere. It's, yep. you know, you don't have to save up five grand to go take a SANS course. It's probably more than that now. Uh, inflation. No, um, you know, you, you, it's, it's, it's this book. It's that class. It's that securitytube.net free video. It's that YouTube show, you know, it's David Bommel, you know, so it's, it's all these things that, you know, you go to all these places and, and that's where your education is. It's, it's your friends, it's your collaboration, it's your influencers. David, there was no such thing as a no. cybersecurity influencer in the nineties. No, Come no. on. Like what? Like influencer like i don't think the kardashians were even a thing at the time you know so that's where we're at now is is you know cybersecurity influencers and 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 following them and, and learning and watching their videos that's the other thing is i feel like we're we're a lot of us don't want to read the white paper because it's too long or they now youtube videos are too long and we want youtube shorts yep we're the tiktok generation give it to me in two minutes like <laughs> what you want me to teach 22 years of hacking in a two minute TikTok? We all need to just step back and come back and, and read these books and watch these, uh, spend 30 minutes to watch this video instead of looking for the short and, and just taking our time to learn. And I would like be a student every single day and be exposed to everyone because it's not just to listen. That's the other thing, David. Like, why would you want to just learn how to hack from a listenate? You're going to learn my style. You're going to learn my tactics and techniques. There's other brilliant vulnerability researchers and, and hackers out there and breakers out there. Like, why do you want to just learn from me? You know, what you're going to learn is are, are the way I've learned. Learn from everyone. Tune into David's show. Tune into my show. Tune into, you know, Dr. Katie Paxton Fears show. You know, tune into all these people because they're all amazing. And, you know, I, I was taking this one class um, just recently, actually, and someone was complaining on Facebook about the course. And it was like this, the, the you know, this was such a waste of time and money um, to, to take this class. Shame on you for only taking that one class. Take a little bit from everyone. Take what you like from everyone. Read, you know, it's just like you don't read one author. You read a good point. multiple authors. So anyway, I'll get my soapbox. No, no, no. I like soapboxes. It's always it's always good to get, <laughs> you know, to get someone's like passion about something. Um yeah. so I think that the problem is when you're starting out, it's difficult to know where to start. Yeah, so you've mentioned yeah. some Okay, so yeah, you've mentioned so, your okay, name, so, you've mentioned some others. It's like Okay, um, so let me all right. I I I took the easy route route on that, that question. Let me let me no, 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 no. okay. All right. My advice is at the very beginning, if you're you're you don't know anything about systems or networking or kind of like this mile white thing, 
go get the book for the common body of knowledge to study the CISSP study guide. Go read that. Read it from front to back. Take notes. That's another thing. Take notes. Don't type notes. Write notes because it's a different type of kinesthetic learning style. Did you yeah. know that? Yeah, you actually point. retain more by writing than typing. Do not type your notes when you're learning something new. Go grab the CBK, read that. Learn the fundamentals of networking. Learn fundamentals of system administration. Start out understanding networking and operating systems. Then once you understand that and get that, then start looking into the, the fundamentals of security, like the confidentiality, inte integrity, and availability, the CIA triad. Understand those tenets of cybersecurity. You know, understand uh, the, the cyber kill chain and the methodology, the modus operandi that people follow in hacking and like uh, reading the penetration testing execution standard. Not just jumping straight to the tools section to figure out what tools you need to download. <laughs> yep. Don't skip the reading, um, but read and and learn because there's all of that. That is the learning path that I would recommend. Start with the CISSP and move outwards. Figure out: Do you want to be a breaker, meaning a hacker, or do you want to be a defender? Do you want to be red team or blue team, or do you want to be purple team? You know, all these colors didn't exist back then either. But you know, I'm trying to get with it. Uh, I'm trying to to um, yeah modernize my vernacular. No, 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 don't um, worry. I mean, so, that, that's yeah. great. I mean, sorry, I was I was actually my question wasn't very clear. I was asking like with with API hacking. Did you did you? I think you you said like um, get a phone. And I think you said mm, the same thing with yeah. a car, like get a phone, get it to connect to like the car and then capture the yeah. traffic and then use okay. Grip Suite or something to like, how do you, like, is there sort of like a, a met methodology or, I mean, we can watch, yeah. a, look, you've got that on your web, oh, sorry, on your YouTube channel, stuff like that, that we can look at. Yeah. Yeah. So there's some videos on my YouTube channel that walk you through how to be an API hacker. What are the tools that you need? What is my process that I follow? There's also some great blog articles that I wrote that are on my LinkedIn Pulse feed. Um, on this as well for setting up your attack lab. So here's here's the, the process. First and foremost, you definitely want uh, the mobile device. You want either an Android phone. You don't need to go out. Don't go on Twitter and say, Alyssa Knight told me to buy $1,500 Android Samsung. <laughs> no. You can go to Best Buy and buy like a $200 or $100 Android phone. Just get an Android platform or install an Android emulator in Linux. That's another thing. But a lot of apps have checks for emulators. So you know, that's not always going to work. But have an Android device that you're going to install the Android apps on that you're going to extract with APK Extractor to be able to download the APK file and load it into Mobile Security Framework or Mob SF, which is a free GitHub project you can download today. And also obviously have an iPhone if you want to do iOS hacking. But I like to work off of Android. The same processes and procedures, tactics and techniques can use on an, uh, on an iPhone. There's just less mess. It's less messy. There's a lot more security controls with iOS, as all of you know. It's a lot easier on Android, um, which is why a lot of the hacking platforms like PwnPad and PwnOS and stuff are Android-based. But get yourself an Android device. Uh, it can be a tablet as well. And then, you know, install APK Extractor app to extract the APKs off of the device, load them up into Google Cloud, download them to your workstation, install MobSF. It supports Linux, Mac OS. I've got MobSF running on Mac. Once you've done that, you can also do what are called woman in the middle, what I like to call woman in the middle, yep. man in the middle, whatever person in the middle attack. There's a great tool called Midim Proxy as well as Burp Suite. You can use those, either of those, to do what's called a Midim attack or Widim attack on the app where you're injecting yourself in the middle of that communication, set the proxy on your phone, and then uh, you can intercept that TLS and SSL encrypted traffic and, and decrypt it. And, and and look at it because you're presenting certificates in both directions. Now, here's the thing. I'm about to publish a new article on how to get around certificate pinning. So a lot of the apps, I won't say a lot, I'll use a different word. Many of the apps implement certificate pinning to prevent mid and widom attacks. There's a way to get around that if they haven't used a sophisticated pinning app, use the basic Android stuff for pinning. The, it can be circumvented with the tool called Frida. Okay. And Frida is basically a real-time tool that will actually uh, run a certain script, which is freely available, to get around pinning. I'm going to be publishing an article on that. I'm in right. the process of hacking numerous banks using Frida because they implemented certificate pinning. And yeah. so yeah. there's very little content out there on how to do this. But, you know, that's my process is 
If, if midem, widem attacks fail using traditional means, it means they've implemented pinning. You can try Frida to get around it. So that's my process is, is decode, you know, load the APK file into MobSF, look for hard-coded API keys and tokens, hard-coded usernames and passwords. That's also a thing, um, unfortunately. And then uh, use things like Frida or uh, midem proxy or burp suite to perform a minimum or widom attack against the app to be able to learn how the API works if it's a private API. And then take those API requests and then feed them into something like Postman. And then you could use Postman to send API requests to the API endpoint and basically mutate those API fields, those requests, to be able to request things like data that doesn't belong to you. There is a website called jot.io. It's jwt.io. Okay. And you can copy and paste your bearer token into jot.io and it will decode the jot token for you. And it and basically this is a form of, it's called OAuth, OAuth authentication. It'll decode it because it's not encrypted, it's encoded. And it will tell you everything in that token. And if there's scopes applied, It'll show you a lot of the times mobile apps developers will not properly implement scopes. And so you can actually request data that doesn't belong to you when there's no scopes applied or if the, you know the, it isn't properly hardened. So it's something to think about. So I, in another interview, I heard you talk about a lot of developers don't implement authentication and authorization correctly. Yeah, so well, the, the two most common findings that I find when hacking APIs that I would urge all of you to look at is OWASP API security top 10, number one, and number two. Number one is broken object level authorization, and number two is broken authentication. And both of those are the most prevalent findings in APIs that I find, where developers will authenticate the API request by looking for that token that I just described, or... Um, they, and, and what happens is once they see the token, like, oh, Alyssa is, is authenticated. I know it's her. She's presenting this token. It's a valid token. Let her do her thing. And it won't authorize the requests to make sure that I'm requesting data that belongs to only me, where I'm sending an API request, for example, to move money from David's account to my account. And I shouldn't be allowed to do that. But because I know his account number, because I changed that account number and the API request to his account number, it's not doing a sanity check to make sure I should even be requesting that account number. So that's broken object level authorization. Um, the other type is broken authentication where just authentication is broken. And in the, in the case of this one bank, I completely removed cookies. I removed authentication. I, it was an unauthenticated request where I can change the pin code and transfer my any bank customer without even authenticating, where it was just so broken that as long as you sent the right API request, the API would, would execute that query. So, I mean, from what you're telling me, there's a huge opportunity for someone who, you know, wants to get into like a specific niche to look at APIs. Because, I mean, APIs are on phones, but they're also, on, I think you worked on nuclear systems and... Like Cor industrial systems, yeah. Sorry, go on. Yeah, correct. So, so um, at one point, I I left cybersecurity for a while and went into high risk zone close protection. Went to close quarter combat training, sniper training. Uh, long story, oh. probably another show. Yeah, another, um, but, another time. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and decided to come back, um, knowing that the conflicts in the Middle East were winding down. I support counterinsurgency operations in Afghanistan and counter ID operations in Iraq. And um, realized that the conflicts in the Middle East were winding down and came back to cybersecurity uh, and uh, started out in uh, critical infrastructure protection and started doing um, cybersecurity at nuclear power plants. Um, San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station, or SONGS, uh, was the plant. And um, I was responsible for running the CSAT teams where I was hacking into SCADA systems. You can niche yourself. Um, and please don't get me wrong. I know earlier in the show, I said, you know, you can be a jack of all trades um, as well. But for those of you who want to niche yourself and say, I just want to be an API hacker. I want to master API hacking. That's okay too. There's no wrong answer here. N you know, the, yeah, there's always going to be trolls, but there's no wrong answer here. If you want to niche yourself, niche yourself. We, as a matter of fact, uh, at the API Secure Conference, which is running tomorrow uh, and on the 7th, it's going to be running for two days. 
60 plus talks, definitely register. Uh, I don't know when this, sorry, I don't know when yeah, this no, show is airing. This will probably be posted, unfortunately. It'll probably but... be after. All right, okay, for those of you who missed the API Secure Conference, I, I was doing a workshop for women non-binary to, to train future women and non-binary in API hacking because we're so underrepresented in API hacking, API security. Yeah, so uh, please, if you're interested in API security, if you're interested in niching yourself, don't be afraid to do so. We need more people in API hacking and API defense who understand APIs. So please definitely learn it if it's something you want to do. When we started the interview, we we spoke about this book, Hacking Connected Cars. I saw like your YouTube video and on your laptop, you're running Ubuntu and then you've got a whole bunch of interesting devices. So in your book, you I think you've, the devices you mentioned like were Wi-Fi Pineapple and some other devices. Why would you use a Wi-Fi pineapple as an example to to hack a to hack a car? Yeah, that's a great that, that's a great question. Uh, you know, one of the things that I, I think I'm uh, known for doing is taking tools or you know just scripts or exploits, whatever, and and using them for a new purpose, repurposing them yeah. where the developer didn't originally intend it for that, but could yeah. be used for something else. Wi-Fi pineapple is a great example of that. So originally, the Wi-Fi pineapple pineapple was created to target uh, you know, wireless clients through a set of different modules that you could turn on and use within the pineapple, whether it's a rogue BTS as a rogue wireless access point or anything else. And I realized that it could also be used for hacking cars because a lot of the car makers today are now implementing wireless communication in cars where the you know, in our infotainment system within the car is communicating wirelessly with the telematics control unit. So there, there, if you think about it, a two cent cable per car can cost a car maker a lot of money. So if they pull that two cent cable out, whether it's USB or ethernet that communicates, that basically connects the infotainment system with the TCU and do it wirelessly, you're saving a lot of money but you're also creating an attack surface. And you can use a Wi-Fi pineapple as a rogue base station where the, the um, infotainment system in the car is acting, acting as the wireless access point. And if you use a pineapple, you can, you can tell the pineapple to broadcast that uh, BSSID or that name and then have force the TCU to communicate or connect with you instead of the uh, in, in infotainment system. And what happens if you're the wireless access point and the TCU connects to you instead? You you can now see all of that traffic that's traversing uh, that communication ch channel between the TCU and the infotainment system. It's repurposing uh, another device that's intended for something else for hacking a different device. In this case, a car. Did you find the same thing where like the security was very bad, for lack of a better word, on the cars, like it was with the API situation. So like the the car developers weren't thinking about these attacks. Yeah, there were, you know, there were definitely some more egregious findings, like for example, pre-computed private key sitting in open world readable directories on the file system of the of the device. It not hard coding, you know, or or taking additional security precautions and the wireless communication between the two devices. You know, it communicating with any uh, cellular tower. So you could use a rogue base station using a, a, pro a device called the uh, Blade RF from a company called Nuant. You could, you could basically uh, imitate uh, a, a legitimate cell tower by creating what's called a rogue BTS. And by broadcasting a stronger signal closer to the car, getting the car to associate to your rogue base station, your rogue cell tower, instead of a legitimate one. And it not having any controls to say, you know what, I'm communicating with a cell tower right now where encryption is disabled. Should I really be communicating with that cell tower? Is that, is that something that's okay? And, and you know, those basic things, I think, are getting better over time with penetration testing and education with the car makers, where they're realizing that cars are no longer just these combustion engines, um, that they're smart, they're computer networks on wheels now. And they need to bring cybersecurity people into their team to make more secure passenger vehicles. And I think with, you know, as EVs come along, autonomous driving, you know, the car makers are realizing that these are more computers that need to be secured, like a traditional computer or traditional application, than they are just 
you know, um, gears on wheels. It's amazing because, I mean, it's like nuclear power plants, all these like control systems are coming online with your connection to the internet. Cars have connections to the internet. It's 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 a bit worrying in some ways because, I mean, someone with your skills, like you said, you, you're applying it from one domain to another. Sometimes yeah. you wonder if it's a good idea to give devices IP addresses. Yeah, you know, it's a thing that we're, we're we live in a real exciting time, David, you know, on that's the thing is, you know, we're, it, there's all this, you know, attack surface around us everywhere because things that were not historically connected are now being given an IP. I love it. I, lo I embrace this innovation. I'm a hacker whose house is like 99% connected, right? Even my water softener in my garage is connected. And it's because I embrace this innovation in technology. And that's what's amazing about humans is we're continuing to innovate. It's not a bad thing. We just need to do so securely. Um, I, a, a particular state in the United States reached out to me to hack their new fleet of connected trains that they're rolling out. Oh, wow. Like, this yeah. is a thing, you know, where humans are being replaced by computers communicating with APIs. And we talked about this earlier in the show where, uh, you know, about APIs being really ubiquitous today. And they really are. They're the plumbing of our financial system. In the UK, you, may, you know, we talked about London and the UK earlier. You know, you guys have PSD2. The United States, it's it's open banking. You know, and those are all powered by APIs. So our entire financial infrastructure is APIs. Our transportation system, APIs, they're ubiquitous. They're everywhere. And it's not something that you're going to be able to avoid anymore. If you're a penetration tester today, mark my words, mark my words, you need to start learning how to hack APIs because that is what's coming if it's not already here. One of the things is my I like starting my conferences out with a, a great quote from Anonymous. And that's, if I were to advise a rogue nation state on how to take down the United States, I would tell them to start with the APIs first. And that's because cyberspace is the ultimate equalizer. And I, one individual, one little old girl in Las Vegas, can take down an entire country simply because I know how to hack APIs. And that entire country is being powered by APIs from industrial control systems all the way to the cars that are driving around on the road. Alyssa, we can go on for hours. I wish I could keep you, you know, talking and talking and talking, but Aww. it's it's been going a long time. So I really want to thank you, you know, for sharing. Um, before I was, we, I, sorry, go on. I, oh, sorry. Oh, I was just gonna say, I, you know, it's, been, it's I, I, yeah, I mean, we have that awesome chemistry. I, I agree. I think we could talk for hours. Uh, I would love to be back on your show. I'd love that, um, yeah. But definitely, uh, thank you for having yeah, me. Yeah, I mean, we didn't talk enough about cars. I want to get into, like, hacking okay. cars more, but we can we, we can call this the API video. But um, okay. for, for, for the audience, please put your comments below. What would you like to know about? Alyssa's got lots and lots of experience. You know, what, what would you like me to ask in, in subsequent videos? Alyssa, just, you know, give us the rundown. I'll put it below. But, you know, where can people connect? Is it Twitter, uh, YouTube channel? Yeah. Where's good places? Yeah. So, um, and for those of you who are going to be commenting on the video, um, you know, I will be monitoring the comment thread on this video when it goes live. So I'll make sure to check in on those comments and, and answer any questions that many of you have. For those of you I, I uh, who are on YouTube, please definitely subscribe to my channel. Hit that yep. bell icon. I'm trying to boost my number of subscribers on YouTube. Um, I upload and live stream a new video every week. Um, that's where I publish my vulnerability research first is YouTube. So definitely check that out. Um, we could definitely talk about car hacking more in, in the next episode when when I'm lucky enough to be invited back on your show. Oh, for sure. Uh, so definitely. As soon as possible. <laughs> subscribe. Yeah. yeah, for sure. So subscribe to my YouTube channel. Uh, I'm one of those rare breeds that is also on Vimeo. I love Vimeo. Okay. The quality of the videos are great there, too. So I'm also on Vimeo. Um, but that's where a lot of our short films are published. And then also connect with me on LinkedIn and follow me on Twitter. So, you know, I'm, I'm also always, of course, as an influencer, as a content creator, I want as many followers everywhere as possible. So definitely connect with me on Twitter and LinkedIn, and I'm happy to talk on those social platforms. Alyssa, thanks so much. You must stay safe. Yeah, thank you, David. Take care. Yeah.